Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third uh, lecture of um, Chapter 4. And we're going to talk about agents of socialization. And um, agents of socialization are the people and uh, um, the groups that you spend time with and the institutions like the media and your family and religion that teach us what we need to know in order to survive in society and also um, how pass on society so that it can reproduce itself. So for most people and in most societies, the family is considered to be the most important agent of socialization and you can probably figure out why uh, the family is where we begin um, and it's where we are kind of most uh, vulnerable to socialization in the sense that we're young and we um, are learning really about how the world works and so we uh, we believe what is going on around us is kind of how the world is I used to joke that when my daughter was uh, you know four or five if I told her that at 18, everyone goes to the moon and spends a month there and then comes back, she would have believed me because she wouldn't have had any idea that that isn't how the world is. Um, so the family tends to be the most important. And then we have the school, right? School plays a large role in socialization. And it's funny how when I'm, I have homeschooled my daughter, it's like socialization is the first thing everyone always brings up um, about school. Um, that as if you homeschool your child, they're never going to learn to interact with other children, um, which always strikes me as funny. I don't know why. So functionalists and conflict theorists look at uh, the socialization role played by school and see it kind of differently. And you can probably imagine that functionalists see the functions, right, that, uh, um, that schools kind of teach us how to be productive, they teach us um, about our own culture and to value our own culture, they teach us to show up on time, uh, they teach us to um, learn new things, they teach us how to, I always laugh that they teach us how to tolerate boredom, um, how to sit still, and then they kind of divide us up into categories, um, and so they serve a number of functions for society. And they serve some dysfunctions for society, right? Functionalism doesn't think everything's just awesome about everything, right? Because for students who don't make it through school, um, they tend to always have a difficult time in, in society, and we don't really have a pathway for people who aren't able to successfully make it through school for them to then be able to have a, a functional role in life. And from a conflict theory perspective, Schools have, um, you know, the kind of overt curriculum of teaching us math and science, but they also have a hidden curriculum, and the hidden curriculum is based upon your social class. So, um, children who go to schools for um, in wealthier school districts or private schools learn how to pursue um, their own interests. They uh, learn how to. Um, you know, kind of value their themselves and uh, get what they want. They learn how to have, they learn extracurricular activities um, to, you know, do things that they enjoy, but they also learn being part of a team, how to uh, take uh, criticism, um, how to deal with adults and other things um, that will come into play and be important when they go out into the world, into the um, upper middle and middle class, which we'll talk about in the next section. And then um, children in uh, schools that are not geared towards the upper middle class and private schools learn things like, you know, how to show up on time, how to be quiet, how to be docile, um, and like I said, how to be bored, how to sit at your desk and be bored without going insane, how to listen to authority, how to be obedient, um, all of things that prepare them to then go out into the workforce and tolerate being treated badly by their boss, um, sitting in a cubicle um, without going nuts, um, and you know, kind of training you 
to be a part of the system that makes money for those in power and uh, keeps you in a place of having you know meaningless work that drains your energy but that uh, per source of income for those in power so peer groups are an important um, source of socialization particularly when uh, people enter kids enter into the tween and teenage years uh, peer groups can be important and um, as children age they can kind of try on different identities by moving in and out of different peer groups um, then we obviously have the mass media which now plays a huge role much larger than it used to uh, where children learn um, you know how to be boys and how to be girls we teach kids from a very young age how to be um, girls and boys I feel like I've done this we've talked about this before but um, when we look at the girls aisle at Target and it teaches girls how to be um, wives and mothers and how to cook and clean and um, do all the little things that we're going to be expecting them so it uh, socializes kids to play the roles that we're going to be expecting them to play later and so socialization of gender is something that the the gender of the child it's something that people want to know it plays this huge role um, there's this thing uh, called a reveal party. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know why I just find things like this so bizarre. But so here's an example of a cake you would have at a reveal party. So people come to this party and you have this cake and then when you cut the cake, oh my gosh, it's going to be a boy. And I always think of, you know, once people know the gender, then they can start buying stuff, right? Because once you buy stuff, I mean, once you know the gender, then you can start to make purchases because up until then, you're kind of constrained. Um, and you're kind of constrained because boy nurseries and girl nurseries look very different. And especially in um, the upper middle class and wealthy people have nurseries that are very gendered, right? And um, you can see these photographs of uh, nurseries and you can always tell right away that this is a nursery for a boy right? and I, most of these images when you do an image, image search for boy nursery come from Pinterest and I'm always fascinated by Pinterest and how it portrays the uh, the upper class and how you can tell from these images that these are not people who are poor um, you know and we're trying to emulate people who are um, wealthy and you know how do we know by looking that this is someone who's wealthy right how can we tell um, that this is someone from the upper middle or upper upper class um, and uh, one thing that I like to point out in class is that you will never see a, uh, um, a, a character from a movie in one of these upper class uh, um, nurseries you know you're not going to see Dora the Explorer you're not going to see um, you know anything from Monsters Inc right you might see Winnie the Pooh um, but you're not going to see any commercial um, character because that's not part of being in the upper class um, and then if we take a look at girl nurseries you probably won't be surprised at how they look, right? And again, with when you're looking at these pictures of girl nurseries from this particular social class, um, there's just a particular look about them. They're very clean and simple. The colors are not bright um, or loud, and the furniture is is very simple. Um, everything's beautiful and calm and um, nothing is you know overdone like this one's a little oh you probably can't see that um, one of them I saw once had if you I'm, I'm looking at I did a search for a girl nursery this one's a little over the top it's got a carriage for a uh, um, crib 
Let's see. <clears throat> Where am I? I'm lost. So not only so do, so we start this kind of gender socialization before kids are born, but we also respond differently to boys and girls as you know once they're born. And as soon as if you hand someone a baby, and if you put a baby in a diaper when they're you know um, three months old, you can't tell whether or not that is a boy or a girl, which is why we dress children in colors and um, stick little bows to baby girls' heads because you can't tell. Um, but if you tell someone this baby is a girl, they'll play with it differently than if you tell them this baby is a boy. So they'll be rougher with it. They'll, um, if it's a boy, they'll, um, you know, do more of the goo goo ga ga if they think it's a girl. So we teach them differently as they um, they grow up based on their gender. We tend to assign them different roles. We tend to have different things going on. Um, today, <clears throat> today's my daughter's birthday. My daughter's nine. And, uh, you know, I've been going nuts with my mom. It's like all I've done since I don't even, I can't even say when. And today's my daughter's birthday. And I like, I, I now have to like sneak out to Target and get her presents and, um, you know, because my husband didn't do anything. Um, and I didn't think to tell him. And, you know, he didn't think to do it. And that's because that's how gender roles work. Right. It's it's women, the woman's job to do things like birthdays. That's uh, traditionally the woman's role. Right. Because that's part of the um, kind of social part of the family. Women tend to organize Thanksgiving. Women tend to, um, you know, uh, take care of uh, uh, <clears throat> when someone is sick. And, you know, so for my husband it's like he saw her birthday coming and that just didn't really mean anything to him um and we don't we don't have parties for my daughter my daughter uh we do um so for each day of her birthday we do something special for that number of days so since she's nine this year we're gonna have nine days where we do a little something each day um so but none of that's been planned none of that's been um, taking care of. Normally we start before her birthday, um, but none of it has been done. <laughs> um, and it, it just, you know, like I walked in the kitchen this morning, I was like, it's Emmy's birthday. And he's like, oh yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, and it's just, you know, it just would not occur to him. It's not that he doesn't love her or love me, but it's just not on his radar. Um, and uh, so anyway, it was just a funny example of the gender roles that um, people play. So even though I'm a radical feminist and <laughs> a sociologist, I, I, I live it too. So um, schools, peer groups, so everything goes towards socialization, the subtle and not so subtle messages. And just like we learn the rules about how to uh, be, you know, how to ride an elevator. We learn how to be a female and how to be a male, and uh, and it and most of it's not spoken out loud, right? We just we watch and we learn. So the I'd like you to do a little assignment for this section, and what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to pretend like uh, you're a scientist from another planet, and you've come to Earth um, for. Uh, the first time and you've made observations and the observations that you've made is that you've been allowed access to uh, the website uh, Vivo. Is that or that, yeah, Vivo. So Vivo is a website of um, current uh, music videos. Well, and they're old videos too. So what I want you to do is I want you to pick three videos, um, I, it doesn't matter which ones you pick. You can pick Kanye's Famous if you want. I watched Fergie's Milf Money um, and was just blown away. Um, and what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to tell us uh, which videos you watched and then your scientific observations of 
the role and status of women on earth. So what are what is it like to be a woman on earth? What are the expectations of women on earth? You know, what are your observations about women on this weird planet based on these scientific uh, on your scientific observations of these films of women? Okay? So that's your assignment for uh, this section and just pick any three you want and uh, um, watch them and then tell us about the ladies of earth.